welcome to Cinebraskans, the daily Nebraskan entertainment podcast. As always, I'm your host, Kyle Cruz, and I'm joined by my co-host. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is David Berman. Um, I am an assistant culture editor for the Daily Nebraskan, so I edit all those good stories that you see up on our website. Yeah, uh, and as I mentioned, I'm Kyle Cruz. I mainly just write movie reviews for the DN, um, some random odd things here and there. Uh, and then host this podcast. And yeah, so the Cinebraskans, pretty much all we do is talk about movies. And so it's been a minute since we recorded and we're, we've got some fun stuff to talk about. So we'll just jump right into our first segment, which is what have I done? And what have I done is the segment where we just talk about whatever we've been watching lately or whatever media we've been consuming, whether that be a movie or a video game or whatever. Um, and so I'll start, let's start with you, David. Uh, what, what have you been up to? Yeah, so, you know, as you said, it's been a while since we talked about movies, and I'm going to delay that a little bit longer because I'm going to talk about a video game. Um, So last time I talked about the the first Last of Us um, and how I'd been playing through that in preparation for the sequel. And uh, the last time we recorded was on the day the sequel was out. So um, by, uh, you know, a a few weeks ago, I I finished up uh, The Last of Us Part Two, And it's fantastic. It's, It's a great, great game. It's gotten a lot of hate uh, as I'm, I'm sure you, you might have seen on Twitter um, it's been a very divisive game uh, I think it's kind of been the last Jedi of this franchise because it goes in some really wild directions and does some things with some characters that I understand why people didn't like them but in general I really I, I love the directions that it went um, it's extremely violent um, even more so than the first one and just, you know, it's, it's the gameplay is really good, but it's hard to say that it's a fun game because it's really just about, you know, it it's a it's a story about revenge and the cycle of violence and about, you know, getting to know these characters and then they get murdered. And <laughs> and so it's just it's definitely a very it's it's not a very uplifting story, but it is a great, great story. Um and I am sad that it is you know, gotten a lot of hate. And I think a big part of that is that there are a bunch of leaks that happened uh, a few games before, a few weeks before the game came out. And I think a lot of, I think in a vacuum, a lot of the plot points would sound kind of dumb and forced. And I think people just kind of latched onto those and just, you know, immediately discredited the game and said it was going to be bad. But I think once you play through the whole thing, it really is an incredible experience. And yeah, it's 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 definitely something that that I really love to play. So, yeah, uh, I think I think your comparison to to the Last Jedi is also something that I've picked up on as well. And I haven't played the first game or the second game, but just kind of because when the reviews started coming out, like everyone was loving it, it was just extremely positive. Uh, and then the game came out, and yeah, as you said, from what I've gathered on on Twitter and such, it's been very divided, very mixed. Um, but so how does, how does the story of this game compare to the story of the first game? Because I remember like when the first game came out, that's like the one thing that people like universally praised about it was its story. Um, does the sequel like live up to that or does it like falter at all? Yeah, so the first game has a, has a much simpler story and it really, you know, it's, it focuses on the characters of Joel and Ellie and their story and it doesn't, it doesn't do a lot of world building and you don't, and there are some side characters that are really good, but it's not, it's, you know, it's a simple story about two people just going across the country to find a cure. And, and, you know, but, but but it is a great story. Um, I think the sequel is a lot more complicated, um, but I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think they could have done just the same old thing. You know, they could have just done another, you know, it's an adventure with Joel and Ellie and they're, they're going to, to, to fight some bad guys and, and kind of thing. And that would have been fine, I'm sure. And especially with the gameplay and the graphics being as good as they are, it would have been a fine game. But I think it takes, like The Last Jedi, it takes a lot of big swings. Um, and for me, they all worked really, really well. Um, but I, I can understand why some people didn't like them. Um, and so I think it absolutely lives up to the first one story-wise. Yeah. Um, so what's, where, 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 where do I want to go with this? I guess 
So how does how does like the gameplay compare? Like, is it playing through the game? Is it as enjoyable as it was for the first game, or like how, what are the differences? Like, because is I assume it's on a new console, um, but I don't. Yeah. Um, so like, how does that compare? Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the first one came out at the end of the PS3 um, and then was remastered for the PS4, and that's what I played it on. Um, and, you know, and this one is coming out at the end of the PS4. Um, so, so it's definitely, graphics-wise, it is so much better. Um, and I think gameplay-wise, even, like, they take all of the elements of the first one and just improve them in every way. Um, the first one is definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's stealth-oriented, but you can, you know you're playing as Joel in the first game. And so he's, he's this, this big guy. He's not very fast. There's not much you can do with him besides kind of shoot and punch your way out of things. And in this, in this game, you're playing as Ellie, who is, you know, she's a 19 year old girl and she's not, you know, a six, with, a six foot five man. Um, and so it's a different style and it's a lot more stealth oriented and it's a lot more about, crafting weapons and using your supplies, you know, in a really um, economical way. It's a lot more about strategy. Um, but yeah, all of the the elements of the first game are there, but it's vastly improved. And there's, you know, with like the melee of the first game, it was pretty much, you could just like mash the punch button and that would get the job done. But now there's like a dodge button in this game. Um, and there are like rope mechanics and the jump button. And so it, it, it just makes traversal and combat like so much better than the first one. Nice. Um, I guess from there, uh, I'll, I'll just jump into, jump into a movie I watched earlier this week, uh, which is a new movie that came out on Hulu called Palm Springs. Um, and Palm Springs uh, stars um, Andy Samberg. And it's basically like a romantic comedy with the same premise uh, the same like living everyday premise as you would get from like a Groundhog Day or like an Edge of Tomorrow or something like that. Um, and the basic like story is um, there's more than one character living the same day. Um, so like when when the, when the movie starts, like Andy Samberg's like already in it. It doesn't like show how he got there. He's just there. Um, and then there's this other, there's this girl. I don't remember the name of the actress that plays her, um, but she ends up like getting stuck in the loop with him and then they both have to continuously live this day together um and it was a really interesting take on that concept it was a very existential take on that concept because they there's a lot of just like Andy Samberg talking about the meaninglessness of life <laughs> um and that was that was fun uh and even though the movie takes such like an existential approach to that concept it was a ton of fun um, just because Andy Samberg's Andy Samberg, so, um, but he and the the main uh, girl in the movie have great chemistry together, and so it was a lot of fun just watching them interact and seeing how they handle the different situations that they're that they're put in. Like there's like a montage of like Andy Samberg's character just not really caring what he does because he doesn't really have any consequences, so him just doing wild things at the at the place they're in. So they're at a wedding. Um, for the for the movie, like they just kind of are living the same wedding day over and over again, and it's like their friend's wedding, and so he just does all these crazy things to like ruin the wedding and just like see what happens, and that was a ton of fun to watch. Um, but J.K. Simmons uh, plays a supporting role in the movie, and I won't say too much about his character because it's kind of fun just like experiencing that character for who it is. But he is far and away one of the best parts of the movie. He's not in it a whole lot, but every time he shows up, it's just an absolute blast. Um, and yeah, I, I loved it. I don't think I was expecting to love it as much as I did. I'd heard like a couple of good things about it online and uh, Kayla and I just like threw it on one night and just, yeah, just had a blast. I would very highly recommend it, but yeah. Yeah, so yeah, uh, as you said, it's it's definitely, a concept that's kind of its own genre at this point um, of just the reliving the same day over and over again kind of thing. And it's, I feel like it's something that at this point has kind of been done to death. So like, how do you feel? And, and you know, you said that it kind of has a different, more existential view of it, but how does it kind of differentiate itself from other movies like it? So I think what, like, while that is certainly like the basic premise of the movie, the movie doesn't focus on that a whole point, uh, a whole bunch. Like the, the point of the movie is like the relationship between the two characters. And that's kind of like where its core is. 
Um, so like, yes, while they're reliving the same day over and over again, um, every day the characters do something different to make that atmosphere change. So even though it is technically the same day, it doesn't, the movie doesn't get repetitive in that sense. Um, it doesn't necessarily like feel that way, which works. Um, because yeah, there's some days that they'll stay at the wedding and some days that they'll just like immediately when they wake up, just drive like to Texas and then just be there for the day. So it feels like, uh, it feels like the like time is moving forward even though it is technically the same day. Um, but yeah, I guess what really differentiates it is yeah, just generally how, how much the movie is focused on the mindsets of these two characters. Um, and it's interesting, like I said earlier, when the movie starts, Andy Samberg is already like in this loop. So you don't know like how long he's been there. You don't know like how he ended up there to begin with. He's just kind of there. Um, and they never really explain that, uh, which I enjoyed because it just kind of provided the premise for what it is, but it doesn't get too caught up in the details. Like it provides you enough to like know what's going on and to generally know like what their situation is, but it doesn't get so caught up in the details of explaining how they got there that it gets confusing. Um, which again, I thought it worked really well. Um, and honestly, like granted there haven't been a lot of movies to come out this year, but it's probably one of the better movies I've seen this year. Uh, I know it premiered, I think at Sundance in January um, and people loved it there. And it was supposed to get uh, a theatrical release this summer but obviously that hasn't happened and it got picked up by Hulu. Um, but yeah, I very highly recommend it. Nice. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I've heard nothing but good things about it. So I'm thinking to check it out this weekend. Yeah. yeah. I guess from there, we'll just jump right into the movie news we've got to talk about. Um, the first bit is as usual, a bit of comic book news. And this, I think this individual piece of news is probably going on like a month old at this point, but it's, a big piece of news that's going to be a lot of fun to talk about and that is the possibility of Michael Keaton returning to the role of Batman. Um, so yeah this I believe it came from Deadline uh, but I could be wrong about that but they're reporting that Michael Keaton is in talks to return to the role of Batman in uh, Andy Muschietti's and Ezra Miller's The Flash movie um, which is based on Flashpoint so we assume that it's going to be like an alternate dimension type thing. Um, and they, they reported that he was going to be playing Bruce Wayne, as you would expect. Um, but then there have also been, uh, there's also been word going around that he could potentially be playing Thomas Wayne, um, which would kind of make sense because Thomas Wayne is a character in the Flashpoint story in the comics. Um, but we don't have confirmation either way on that. Um, but yeah, I think this is a really interesting idea. Um, and it's not an idea that really had ever crossed my mind. Uh, but I'm just really excited to see Michael Keaton back uh, in the bat suit and just generally to see what they can do with his version of the character in today's like world. Um, and yeah, I think it'll definitely get people interested in the Flash movie that either way, that otherwise may not have been. Um, just because I don't know, I feel like the Flash is kind of everywhere right now. Um, so there was a, I think there's a possibility that this movie would come out and then people would just be like, oh, it's The Flash, you know, there's like eight seasons of a TV show, like, they're not like super excited about it. And plus, like, not a lot of people are big on Ezra Miller in the role. Um, but I think having Michael Keaton in there definitely provides uh, a supporting role that could uh, get a lot of people into the theater. Um, and I had completely forgotten that Andy Muschietti, uh, who directed the two It films, uh, is directing this movie until like earlier today. Um, and I think it'll be really interesting to see what Michael Keaton's Batman looks like in his hands. Um, I think it could be a really interesting take. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. What do you think, David? Yeah, I mean, I, I love uh, Michael Keaton's Batman. Um, and I think that's a really interesting universe. I think I have a lot of questions about how they're going to do this, but not in a sense of like, I don't want them to do this. I just, I, I'm very curious in what directions that they can go with it, whether they're going to tie it to the Burton universe, whether I, I've heard talk that he's going to be kind of like a Nick Fury kind of character going forward, potentially where he kind of pops up in different movies, um, which I think could be interesting. Um, they, and they had said the same thing about Henry Cavill. So <laughs> maybe yeah. they'll, just have, they'll just have a bunch of, people making cameos in movies uh but yeah um 
I, I've, I've also heard that he's going to be in the bat suit at some point, um, which I think might be kind of weird at this point, but yeah. also I think, you know, that would be cool to see him again. Um, so yeah, I am, I am very, very excited for this. And, and I hope, you know, maybe past a, a flash movie, we get some sort of like Batman beyond kind of universe, which I think would be really cool. Yeah. Um, one of my main takeaways from this story is that DC is definitely, and DC and Warner brothers are definitely not done like putting effort into into their universe that they have, whether it's connected or not, like they're they're still all in on this. Um, and I think I think we might end up getting like an official confirmation of this at uh, DC Fandom next month um, because I think they're teasing a lot of big announcements for that. Um, and I think D- DC has obviously uh, not had the greatest track record over the past ten years. Um, but they're really trying to get like back, uh, back in like the forefront to be a legitimate competitor to Marvel. Um, I think this is a a good step to take if that's what you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, I guess moving on from there, uh, we've just got some uh, we got various other news to talk about. Um, so we'll just go down our list here. Uh, but first of all, we'll just talk about Tenet, uh, and we don't know when this movie is going to come out. It's currently still scheduled for August twelfth but it's going to be delayed. Um, there were reports coming out earlier this week uh, that like industry analysts are just saying that there's no way they make this release date. Um, and so, yeah, it might get pushed to the end of the year. It might just get pushed by a few weeks because that just seems like what they've been doing lately. They've just been pushing it every couple of weeks and just hoping that that date works, but surely they can only do that for so long. Um, but yeah, what, what do you think, David? When do you think we're going to end up seeing Tenet? Um, I think, you know, without being too pessimistic, I really don't see a world where, you know, we're going to the movie theater in a month or two. Um, I think maybe, you know, for some sort of holiday release. Um, but I think probably more likely is that it's in, into next year. Um, I think just at this point with, you know, the way things are tracking around the country and, um, you know, they, they've, is it Warner Brothers? Yeah. Um, Warner Brothers has put a lot of money into this movie and I, they're not going to release it until they feel that they're going to get somewhere close to the box office that they would get in a normal time. Yeah. Uh, you know, because they have no reason to, to do otherwise. Um, and, and I know, uh, I've heard that Christopher Nolan and them have been clashing on when they want to release it. And I think he wants to release it sooner than later because, you know, I don't think he really cares about the box office because, you know, yeah. like it's not, it's not like a bad box office is going to tank his career at this point. Um, so, but yeah, I think, yeah, sadly, I, I don't think we're going to be seeing this for a while. Yeah, I agree. I think Warner Brothers is hoping that Tenet can be like the first big movie back in theaters once theaters start to reopen, which is probably why they've been, when they've been delaying it, they've only been doing it by a couple weeks at a time um, because they don't want to delay it too far and then not get that spot. But yeah, at this point, like you just have to wonder like when, when is that time going to be? Uh, Because it seems like, yeah, every week now we're getting like a new announcement of tenant delay um and it's just kind of it's kind of getting repetitive at this point um but yeah i guess we'll find out hopefully we get it by the end of the year i'm sure we'll get it at some point um but yeah i guess moving on from there uh we got the news so a while back we had talked about uh the report that ryan gosling was going to be starring in a uh, a remake of the wolfman from universal um, that is apparently based on a pitch that he provided for, for Universal. Um, and at that time, we had no word on who was going to direct, but it's being reported now that Lee Whannell uh, is going to be directing uh, this adaptation of The Wolfman, uh, which Lee Whannell directed The Invisible Man earlier this year um, and Upgrade a couple of years back. Uh, obviously, is in very good standing with Universal and Blumhouse in terms of these uh, their Universal monsters, considering The Invisible Man was as fantastic as it was um so yeah i am really excited about this i still am not entirely sold on ryan gosling's casting here just because i like i love ryan gosling but i don't see him in this role um but with lee winnell on there like 
I, yeah, I'm just ridiculously excited for this. I, I don't think there is a reason not to be looking forward to it. Um, and so, yeah, what do you, what do you think, David? Yeah, I think, um, I, yeah, I'm definitely excited for this. I think w- with, with Lee, with Lee Winnell, you know, the, um, uh, Universal doesn't have the best track record the last few years, but, but he made a really good one. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm excited for it. I think it has potential to be really good. And I think, like I said, when we first talked about this, um, like in the invisible man, they kind of took this, this this old story and kind of just like remade it and kind of gave it more of a technological twist to it. Um, I think you could do something similar with the wolf man, um, and not make it just a man is turning into a wolf and that's it. Like, like you can really kind of update it for the modern day. So yeah, I, I think I, I too am still a little, I'm not super jazzed about seeing like Ryan Gosling and like a CGI, like wolf, like costume, yeah. like howling at the moon or something like that. Like, but you know, I'm sure it'll, it'll, it won't be that that cheesier they'll just do like teen wolf prosthetic effects on him that would be great <laughs> or, they, or they do it like what we do in the shadows and they, they're just like a really really bad werewolf costume yes. <laughs> <laughs> i think i think that could be a lot of fun yes, um but yeah i guess moving on from there uh we're going to talk about uh some casting with david lowry's uh live action remake of peter pan for disney because disney isn't done remaking their animated classics i guess um but yeah the casting we got is uh jude law it has come on board to play no pun intended uh to play captain hook um which i'm not super excited about this movie just because i don't see the need for a live action peter pan uh from from disney we've gotten like we had pan a couple years ago granted that wasn't from disney but that was a train wreck um and i feel like just live action versions of peter pan are just kind of really hard to get right um, and I'm not really sure, yeah, if it'll work. But um, I think Jude Law playing Captain Hook is really fun casting. I'm a big fan of Jude Law, and I think putting him in this cartoony of a role is going to be is going to be entertaining at least. Um, and I, I have faith in David Lowry. Uh, he directed Pete's Dragon a couple of years back, which was another uh, Disney like live action remake that didn't get a lot of love, but I honestly really liked it. Uh, I thought it, I thought it was a ton of fun, um, but then he also directed a ghost story a few years ago and uh, the old man and the gun last year. Which the old man and the gun, uh, if you haven't seen it, check it out. It, I think it was Robert Redford's like last star in, like movie that he was the main character in. Um, and so yeah, check that out. But yeah, I think this is interesting casting. Um, we'll see what this movie actually ends up being. But yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I just I don't I don't want. <laughs> I don't want this really. <laughs> like I just there have been so many Peter Pan things um I don't really see how there can be another we can add more to this story um I yeah I think Jude Law is good casting but like I feel like you could have said the same thing for Hugh Jackman as as, as Captain Hook I, like I feel like they're very similar I mean like they're generally kind of similar actors yeah. uh and and that and we all know how that turned out so <laughs> I just I I I I don't want to I don't want this. So. Yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see how this goes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Moving on from there, uh, we're we've got another Disney movie. Uh, this time it's the Pirates of the Caribbean. So again, this is a franchise that we've been talking about off and on for like a year now because Disney's trying to figure out what they want to do with this franchise. Um, but we got the word uh, a few weeks ago that Margot Robbie is going to be starring in uh, whatever the next Pirates of the Caribbean movie they they make is going to be. Um, apparently this Pirates of the Caribbean movie that she's attached to is separate from the already announced reboot of the franchise. So I guess they have two different Pirates of the Caribbean movies in separate universes in development at the same time, which I don't really understand the mindset behind. Um, but it's one of, uh, the producers of Birds of Prey has also, uh, been attached to the project. Um, I don't know. I like I'm a fan of Margot Robbie. I liked Birds of Prey. I'm a fan of Pirates of the Caribbean. But I just don't know if I'm on board with this project. Like, I don't know. I think they should just kind of let I, I think I said this last time we talked about Pirates of the Caribbean, but I think they should just kind of let this franchise be. Like, there's really no need to go back to it. Like, yeah, it's a billion dollar franchise, but people are kind of getting tired of it. Um and yeah, it's 
I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really looking forward to this. I'm, Margot Robbie is a great actress. I'm sure she'll do a good job. But I'm just not terribly interested in the movie itself. Um, but you know, my mind could always change with the trailer. But yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. What are your thoughts, David? Yeah, I mean, I think I have never seen a Pirates of the Caribbean movie, so I don't have a ton of thoughts on it. I, I you know, again, yeah, I like I like Margot Robbie. I li- I really like Birds of Prey. Um, but yeah, it just seems like they don't really know what to do with this, this franchise. And I think I've said this before. It's not, it's a franchise that's based on a theme park ride. So there's not any pre-existing lore that they can build off of. And so I think they're, they're having trouble developing this as, you know, they have nothing, they, they just, they have nothing to go off of except their own imagination. And so I think they're having a little bit of trouble with that. So yeah, I think that's yeah. Yeah, um, moving on from there, uh, we got the news, and this just broke probably like an hour ago from when we're recording this, uh, that Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans are teaming up to star in The Gray Man, which is an adaptation of a book uh, that's going to be directed by the Russo brothers, and it's co-written by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely, who are who the Russo brothers worked with uh, on, I think, every one of their Marvel movies that they did, um, and it's going to be going to Netflix uh, with a $200 million budget. So I think Netflix is definitely hoping that this can be a continuous franchise uh, that they can just kind of keep coming back to, especially with the likes of Ryan Gosling, and Chris Evans and the Russo brothers on there. Um, and they're obviously putting money into it. Um, David, you said that you had seen a little bit about like what the actual story is going to be. So I'm going to toss that over to you, but yeah. Yeah. So it seems like it's, it's about a deadly duel between two killers um, who are either are members of the CIA or former members of the CIA. Um, And what Anthony Rizzo has said about it is that it's a lot like Captain America, the Winter Soldier, but it's in a real world setting. And so I think that's really interesting. And I, and Winter Soldier is already probably, you know, one of Marvel's most grounded movies in general. And I think, and feels like it could take place in the real world. And so I think that's a really interesting idea and something that they would, they've already proven that they can do. So I, I'm, I'm definitely excited for this. Yeah, I think the casting of Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans is really interesting. Cause like Chris Evans, obviously we've seen uh, him work with the Russo brothers before. I think we're both big fans of Chris Evans. And as we were just talking about, we're both big fans of Ryan Gosling as well. Um, I don't think they've worked together before. Not that I can remember. I don't um, think so. so I think they're a really interesting pairing. Uh, it'll be, yeah, I'm curious to see like how they play off of each other, especially in uh, these kinds of roles. Um, but yeah, I think this could be a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm tentatively looking forward to it. Oh, me too. All right. Uh, then we've got a couple brief TV things we want to touch on before we get into the main topic. Uh, first of all, uh, HBO Max has announced, uh, or Warner Brothers has announced that they're developing a Gotham PD show. Uh, for HBO Max. So it's just yeah, a TV show focused on the Gotham Police Department that apparently is set in the same universe as Matt Reeves uh, and Robert Pattinson's The Batman that's coming out next year or is supposed to be coming out next year. Um, so I think this is really interesting because I'll, when this news came out, a lot of people were just let, uh, were already talking about how like Gotham was already a thing and there were what, seven seasons of that, six seasons of that, however many there are. Um, which I watched like the first half season of Gotham and just kind of didn't watch the rest of it. But David, you watched Gotham. Uh, I, sadly, I sadly have seen every episode. <laughs> um, but from my, from my like sort of outside perspective, I think Gotham kind of started as a cop show and then turned into just like a Batman's villain show. And so I think this could be an interesting, like kind of another swing at that idea of just kind of a show focused on like the cops within Gotham City and I think having it connected to um to the actual like Batman film that they're working on I think is a really good idea because then you actually get uh, a lot of the stars from that that can pop up in it so like I believe it's Jeffrey Wright that's playing Commissioner Gordon so I assume he will be one of the main characters of the show which I'm really excited about I love Jeffrey Wright um so yeah I I think this is a really good idea um I'm sure that they'll do a lot to differentiate it from Gotham, or at least I hope they would. Uh, but yeah, I guess we'll find out. As someone that's seen Gotham, David, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think, you know, I, I've, I've talked about Gotham on the show before, and I have a love-hate relationship with Gotham. I think there are a lot of good concepts in Gotham, and I think there are some 
you know, good arcs, but it, it does just get, it just gets muddled down with so many characters and trying to build the lore of Batman and also trying to make the, all the police stuff interesting that it just became a mess. Um, and I think what could make it different, what, what Gotham PD could, you know, how it could be different than Gotham is, you know, it, it seems like it, Gotham was an origin story. Um, it was focused on Jim Gordon and his rise through the Gotham PD, but it was also about Bruce Wayne and how he became Batman and all that stuff was bad. Um, but I think with this, it's an already established universe. Batman already exists in this universe. Um, and I think I've seen a lot of speculation that it could focus a lot more on kind of some lower level members of the Gotham PD. Like you could do a Renee Montoya, who's kind of like this, this, this detective and she's also a superhero, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, in birds of prey. Yes, yes, she is. Yeah. She, um, she was, yeah, she was one of the birds of prey. Um, and, uh, yeah. And so I think there's an opportunity to, you know, Batman can show up every once in a while or he's on the periphery and Jim Gordon can be in a few episodes, but it's more about like these lower level mem members of the police department. And maybe it's more about like the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy of it. And like, what is it like to live in this insane universe where there are penguin men and clown men running around, you know? And so I think that could be really interesting and I think could uh, be different and better than Gotham, so. Yeah, I'm hoping it's not just kind of like a by the numbers police like procedural show that just happens to be set in Gotham. Yeah. Um, but I think the fact that it's going to be going on HBO Max um, is a little encouraging. So because I it, I think Warner Brothers is actually going to be trying to put some like effort into making sure this is of quality, especially if they're connecting it to their Batman movie, which. I also think it's exciting because it's showing that they're not done with that universe that they're building um, because the got the Batman movie that they're making is entirely separate from all the other DC movies they're doing right now. Um, but having this show kind of expands that universe a bit and gives it some air. Um, so I think that's exciting. But yeah. I think this, I and, think this will be interesting. Yeah. And I think um, it gives out an opportunity for, some lower level lower level villains who would never be like in a batman movie like you could be like calendar man is in an episode or like i don't know like a king shark like, you know it's like characters that are very strange and just like weird niche comic book characters who would never like headline a movie but yeah. could have really interesting arcs on like a tv show so yeah it's like the because obviously batman's got one of the most extensive and iconic rogues galleries of any comic book character so there's so many characters that you could bring into this um and i think you could honestly it might be a way for, to revisit like villains that have already been used but they don't want to use again in a movie so you could bring in like like a scarecrow or like a bane or something that they've already done like in christopher nolan's batman movies fairly recently um, but it allows that version of the character to exist in that universe without having to dedicate a movie to them. Uh, yeah. And I think that could be really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess moving on from there, uh, the other TV show we wanted to talk about is that Star Wars and Disney have announced uh, an animated, uh, a new animated show called The Bad Batch, which is kind of a spinoff of The Clone Wars. Um, so Clone Wars Season 7 launched uh, just recently. Um, and the Bad Batch, uh, I guess, is a spinoff of a group of characters that were introduced in like the first three episodes of the new season. And they're basically just a group of clones uh, that were like defective or had like specific traits added to them that made them different. Um, and so they each have like their own little niche that they're good at. Um, and I so I haven't finished Clone Wars season seven yet, but I did watch that arc. Um, and I thought the Bad Batch was interesting. I thought that they were uh, like a unique group of characters for the show and just for Star Wars in general. Um, I'm not sure if I want an entire show based off of them. Like I would be interested in seeing them pop up like somewhere else in the future because I think it's an interesting idea. But I feel like having an entire show based off of this group is, I don't know, I can't, it's not really something I would be interested in watching. I feel like they're something that should have just been kind of like reserved to like the many Star Wars comics that they've got going. Um, but who knows? This could be great. I know Dave Filoni's involved, and so that's always encouraging, especially when it comes to the animated shows. Um, 
but yeah, like I'm, I'm, I love Star Wars. I'm a big Star Wars fan, but yeah, this I'm not particularly excited about, but hey, it's new Star Wars content. So I guess I can't complain too much, but yeah, David, as someone that hasn't really watched uh, much of the Clone Wars, if any of the Clone Wars, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Not really. Um, I've always wanted to get into the Star Wars animated universe um but you know it's just something that i haven't gotten around to yet but i'm sure eventually someday i will so maybe you'll do it with the bad batch <laughs> yeah. all right um but uh, yeah i guess moving on from there we're gonna jump into our main topic for the week um and our main topic uh, it's kind of similar to what we did last time we had fun last time just kind of reflecting on inception and just talking about that so we're gonna do that again except this week we're gonna talk about jaws just because we wanted to watch Jaws. So <laughs> here we are. Um, yeah, so Jaws, everyone knows what Jaws was. We don't have to explain this. It came out like 45 years ago. Uh, I believe uh, last, uh, like just a month ago was like its 45 year anniversary. Um, and so, yeah, I hadn't seen this movie probably in like five, five-ish years or so. It's been a minute. Um, and yeah, it's, what can you say about Jaws that hasn't been said before? It's fantastic. It absolutely, for me anyway, it absolutely just like lives up to any sort of expectation you'll have for it. Um, and one thing that I noticed this time around is just like how low budget this movie is. Um, Cause like, I think I looked it up earlier and I think it has like a $9 million budget, which like for 1975 isn't like too bad, but just in general, like that's for a movie of this scale, like that is not a lot to work with. Um, and you can kind of tell when you're watching the movie, mainly because they, they hide the shark and uh, just like do all these things to work around it. But that just makes it so much better because when you don't see the shark, you your like imagination kind of uh, kind of determines like how big it is and that kind of stuff. And you're just kind of more scared of that. Um, but yeah, David, what what specifically about Jaws on this walk on this uh, watch through stood out to you? Uh, I think you know. Uh, I, I'd only seen it once, and I, you know, a long, long time ago. Um, and I think what really stood out to me this time was actually kind of looking through the trivia of it afterward, and and just the process of making this movie was so fascinating because it had so many problems. Um, the shark sank to the bottom of the ocean the first time they put it in the water, um, and they didn't account for the fact that it was going to be in salt water, so it like messed up the controls and like that's why that's why you don't see the shark like it was going to be in it more and i think that's that's such a fascinating look at like the creative process and something that they thought was going to be a disaster because the shark is barely in it when it's the main focus um actually makes it so much better because yeah I, like you said it just it makes your imagination go and there are so many iconic sequences because you don't see the shark like the, like at the beginning and um, when all of, you know, everyone's in the water and, and, uh, there's so many great shots of like underwater and you see the swimmers from below and it just creates such a great tension. Um, yeah. So, so I think just reading about how it was made and what a, just a horrible process it was for everyone involved is just really, really interesting. Yeah, I want to I want to like a tally of like all of the underwater shots of lakes in this movie cuz like there's got to be like at least like dozens of them. Like yeah. it just yeah. it keeps coming back to it, but every time it comes back to it it's always thrilling. Like it's always cuz you you never know what's going to happen. And I appreciate how one of the the first extended sequences of uh the shark like when everyone on the beach is like going into the water on the 4th of July um and how uh, Spielberg just picked a couple random people and just decided to focus on them in the water. So like there were a couple people that like kept coming back to and kept cutting between. So you didn't know who the shark was going to attack. Um, and that just did a really good job of, of building suspense. And then it ended up, I don't think it ended up being any of them and it ended up being someone else, but mm. um, yeah, I just thought it was really interesting. Uh, but one of the, one of the performances that stood out most uh, this time around for me was uh, Robert Shaw as Quint. Just because Quint is a character that he doesn't like have a whole lot to him. He's just kind of a gruff fisherman. But Robert Shaw does such a good job in the role um, that like it doesn't really feel like he's acting. It just feels like they went and got some gruff, tough guy and just like put him in, in there and just like just act how you normally would. 
just um, just just sing some sea shanties and and say some insane things about hunting sharks and and your yes. Yeah. Um, and that character is just like a ton of fun to have there, but there's also like a lot of emotional built into the um, emotion built into the character, specifically when he's talking about like being on the Indi uh, the Indianapolis and just like that experience kind of adds another layer to that character. So it even, yeah, it just like all the characters in the movie kind of have their own motivations and have their own like mindsets on what they want to do with shark and like how they want to approach the situation. Um, and so I think it was really interesting, like giving Quint the backstory that they did. Um, and just having uh, Brody, Quint, and Hooper, like on the ship, on the boat, like just the three of them for basically like the last entire act of the movie, I think was a really uh, good idea because all three of them are such different characters that have such like different approaches to this. So it was fun seeing them interact and seeing how they would work together and how they would like struggle to struggle to get along in this really tense situation. Um, and yeah, it's, it was great. Um, what did you think uh, about John Williams score? So obviously John Williams score is iconic, um, but upon a rewatch, how do you think it held up? Yeah, I think it's something that's been parodied so many times that it, you know, I think I would not have been surprised if I have, if I'd gone back to this and it wouldn't have been as effective, but it still is. I mean, it's, you know, the Jaws theme is just the same thing over and over again, but it's, it works every time and it, it helps build that sense of dread and you know exactly what's coming, but it's still terrifying. And I think that that's, that's great. And something I, I, had, I had read upon just like looking up trivia when John Williams played that for Steven Spielberg the first time, uh, Spielberg was like, oh, that's funny, John. What, what do you actually have in mind? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he, he did not like it upon first listen. And that's probably the main reason why this movie is so, you know, has been remembered for, for such a long time. A main reason for that is, is that score. So Yeah, I agree. I think... I think one of the most like underrated parts about the score is pretty much everything else except for the main theme. Cause obviously the main theme is like what everyone remembers and what everyone jokes about. But even just like when they're on the ship, just the general score, like the kind of like adventurous at atmosphere that it creates um, is really effective. Um, and I think doesn't get enough love. And there were a couple points in which like uh, in the score, they just put like orchestral versions of like the sea shanties that like Quint was singing. Uh, so it was fun like hearing that and hearing that tied into the story um and yeah obviously john williams is one of the better film composers in film history um so it's really interesting kind of like hearing because i want to say this was like some of his earlier work uh, it was before he was like john williams as we know him yeah. today like he'd obviously done a few things but uh yeah it's it's always fun going back to like the score that like makes a composer a name um it's the same thing with spielberg um yeah. this is what made him and i think that's really interesting um and uh 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 a little side thing real quick not not to get too political but, but i thought it was interesting um seeing a, a a a government uh faced with a a you know a potential danger for its citizens and then being like we're not going to shut things down we we this money things are fine and denying things until it blows up in their face and i just thought that was a very interesting parallel to 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 these times that we are living in so yeah i without getting too much into it i i agree it was definitely it felt weird while watching it just be like this feels eerily reminiscent of yep. some yep. things that may or may not be happening right now but you know <laughs> that's another topic <laughs> um but I, I just want to, out of curiosity, I want to look at what, because I see on IMDb that it won three Oscars. I want to know what three it won. So it looks like it won Best Sound, Best Editing, and Best Music. Um, and it was nominated for Best Picture, but did not win. Um, so yeah, I think that's obviously deserved. Um, yep. It, it's an all-time classic. Like, it's, it's Jaws. Everybody knows Jaws. Um, I, I thought it was funny watching... I, I Sorry, you go. Oh no, okay. Um, I the shark, man. The shark still holds up. Like it's it's incredible that that shark does not look like just like a pile of crap because it's a it's it's a 1975 animatronic shark that did not work <laughs> like at all. Um, but it's 
looks really good. I mean, like you def, you know, and I think it definitely helps that sharks in general. There's not much life behind their eyes. They're not very expressive creatures. So I think if it was, I don't know, an animatronic dog, like you know, like that would have been a lot worse. But like, it still absolutely works. And the brief moments that you do see it, especially at the end, are great. And and yeah. would still absolutely hold up today. I, I agree. Uh, I think there's definitely a few moments where you can tell it's an animatronic that you can tell it's not real. But part of like what makes it work, I think, are the performances around it and just like the genuine fear that you get out of all of the actors because they're selling their fear so much, it makes you afraid of the shark, whether or not it looks real, um, which I think is obviously, yeah, a, a great part of the movie. One thing I think is kind of funny is that so this movie came out before the PG-13 rating was a thing. So like this is a this is a pretty violent movie. This is like, there's there's a lot of blood in this movie and yet it's still rated PG, which I just think is hilarious. Yeah. Uh, compared to like a lot of the PG movies that come out today. Um, but yeah, I, 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 can imagine, uh, I can imagine like a parent taking their kid to this movie accidentally and just having them be terrified <laughs> because it's PG. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it ended up being one of Spielberg's later movies that like single-handedly made the PG-13 rating. Um, Cause that was, uh, I believe the second Indiana Jones uh, was, was like the first one considering yeah. like there's a man taking out another man's heart and they're like, well, we can't really make that PG. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, um, Jaws, it's, it's always, it's always good for, uh, for a rewatch. It's always fun. Um, but yeah, it's great. Any any last closing thoughts from you on from you, David? Yeah, just one. I think I think it really like as I was thinking about it. It it's it is the definitive movie of its genre, and I think there is nothing else that comes close to it. And I think that's very rare. You know, like and and I guess the the genre of shark movies isn't you know a a, a major thing, but it's you know nothing. You know, Jaws is the shark movie, and no other shark movie has come anywhere close to replicating it. Yeah. I think that that's, you know, that that's a really interesting thing. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and definitely something that Spielberg is good at doing, you know? Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, Jaws is pretty much just like the first summer blockbuster. Like it's, yeah. uh, it's the first movie to come out and like capitalize on its season and just like catch people's attention and make them want to go to the movies for the summer. Um, uh, so in a lot of ways, we have Jaws to thank for, I mean, we haven't had any summer blockbusters this summer, but in general, like the amount of like major movies, like Marvel movies, Jurassic Park, whatever, uh, that come out every summer. Um, and while that was probably inevitable, it still started with Jaws. And when watching the movie, it's understandable to see why. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. so... This has been Cinebraskans, the Daily Nebraskan Entertainment Podcast. Uh, as always, I've been your host, Kyle Cruz, uh, joined by my co-host, David Berman. And yeah, um, you can find us on social media. Uh, I'm on Twitter at Cruz Reviews, K-R-U-Z-E. Um, and then I'm on Letterboxd as well. But I don't remember my name on Letterboxd, so we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> If, if you really want to find me on Letterboxd, you can shoot me an email, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, David, if you would like to plug anything, go for it. Yeah, I'm at uh, Twitter. I'm D underscore A underscore Berm. Um, and yeah, I think I'm the Berm on Letterboxd. Um, and also quick plug, we got, a, we got another culture podcast this summer called the Star City Culture Committee. Uh, and it is myself and our two other culture editors, Jenna Thompson and Mark Champion. And we will be interviewing um, some great Lincoln artists, and uh, on this last episode, we had a, a mini concert that we did, so definitely make sure to check that out, too. Yeah, and yeah, uh, thanks for tuning in. Bye.